Welcome to the podcast of data and analytics in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. Good morning, Chris. Welcome to the Analytics Show podcast, and thank you so much for uh, video conferencing all the way from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to learn more about the the AI and the data science. Uh, what is happening in this particular, especially in this region? Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm also excited to be here and to be able to share my story and my experience with your audience. We'd love to hear your story. I think it is the, especially the story from this side of the region is something that I am dying to find out and I'm sure that many listeners would want to, to know as well. Now, before I started, I, I know you have taken, I noticed that you have taken the role of Beirut Ambassador and Regional Lead at CTAI, CT.AI as a volunteer work since 2017. Tell us a little bit more about this volunteering experience. Yeah, so basically, um, I came across CTAI, uh, the community back in 2017. I was actually, um, I just started doing some community work in, in Lebanon and building kind of a, a community around AI. And it happened that I was traveling to, to Amsterdam with a couple of friends and I was looking for some meetups around artificial intelligence to kind of, you know, check out while I'm there. And I came across Amsterdam AI um, and then basically they introduced me to City AI, which is a global community of AI mm -hmm. chapters all over the place. And uh, I immediately thought this is very exciting. It's a way for us to, you know, connect cities together. So um, um, I reached out to them. I, we had a chat and I decided to kind of lead the Beirut AI community. So we opened up a chapter in Lebanon uh, and this started the journey of Beirut AI. And this has also you know, led me to eventually founding Zaka. Wow. So that is quite a story, especially how you found out about that whole thing just from your travel in Amsterdam. Do they have many of these in, do they have the equivalent one in Australia or other parts of, of the world? Um, yeah, definitely. So CTAI has, I think, around 70 chapters all over the, the world. Um, some of them are not as active as others. I do believe we have uh, one in Melbourne, Australia, um, and one in Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm not sure how active they, they are at the moment. Uh, and basically, all over Europe, we have some in the US, uh, mm. and then uh, Latin America, and um, yeah, Asia as well, and Africa. So, as I said, like 70 plus uh, cities. So, what do you guys try to achieve of this city.ai, or especially uh, what are you try to do uh, for the Beirut version of it? So, the city AI basically goal is. Um, you know, allowing everyone access to artificial intelligence. So basically just bringing people together to discuss AI, to share lessons learned, um, to, you know, share experiences and help each other where, you know, wherever it's possible. And so usually it depends from city to city. It's not like there's a fixed format, but usually cities uh, would host different types of meetups or maybe workshops and all in the effort of raising awareness on AI and helping you know, more people understand and um, figure out what is this AI that, you know, we've been hearing about, how can this be useful for me in my business or in my project or, you know, however I'd like to, to use it. And so it's really flexible format. It's not like it's fixed. Each city can do its own, um, you know, type of event that, that works for that city, as long as it's kind of helping people get into AI and understanding the concept behind it. So how is that different to the AI events that is already organized by any other organization or company, uh, etc.? Um, 
I mean, it depends, right? It's a very broad question. So there are a lot of similarities. There's a lot of people organizing events around artificial intelligence because, as you know, it's it's a it's a hype, right? Uh, everyone is excited. Everyone is really interested to, to know more about AI. And so, um, I mean, it depends again from city to city. What we do, for example, in Beirut, we're focusing a lot on the technical aspect of AI. And so, when we first started doing uh, our events. Uh, because there's not not a lot of traction in the region here. There's not, not a lot of companies working in AI and, and implementing AI. So everyone is interested, but no one's actually doing anything with it. And so when we started doing those technical workshops and helping developers apply artificial intelligence, you know, hands on, uh, this has gotten a lot of traction and a lot of excitement. And so we started doing a lot of educational um, w workshops and events around artificial intelligence. It seems like that is what also led you to decided to start the company called Zaka. Tell us a bit more, Jack, a little bit more about Zaka and and your role as the founder and and CEO at Zaka. Hundred percent, Jason. Uh, so, in fact, my journey started, you know, a bit before founding Beirut AI. So I was initially a software engineer. I've been working in tech for the last twelve years. And uh, during my uh, my first startup, uh, which was around eight years ago, I came across machine learning and artificial intelligence as a way to uh, we needed to add some you know capabilities to our product, and it had to use machine learning. And so I I came across the field. I absolutely fell in love with how you know everything works in AI. And um, you know after a couple of years, my startup did not make it. But you know I I had a passion for AI, and I really wanted to share this this knowledge. And you know my passion with other members, and uh, it was around that time as well where uh, I met City AI and, and I decided to found the Beirut AI community. So as I said, we founded the community, and the whole idea was to push the AI ecosystem in Lebanon to have more people, uh, you know, uh, aware of AI and implementing artificial intelligence. You know, and so we started doing those meetups. We did, uh, as I said, more of technical workshops, and because this is what the audience was was asking for. So uh, a lot of people were interested in AI, but they were asking us, like, how can I apply this? How, what should I do? How can I write code to build models that can, you know, do X or Y or Z? Um, so we started doing workshops, and this is where I actually realized that there's a big need for people to really understand and apply AI from, you know, practically, not just listening to other people talking about AI, but mm -hmm. actually understanding how they can uh, implement it themselves. And so. And the same problem that we found in Lebanon was also found you know, elsewhere in the region as well. Um, so at that time, I was still working as a consultant on different AI projects, but I realized that I need to dedicate you know, my full time on this mission of bringing AI to the MENA region you know, through education. Uh, and this is why or when Zaka was born. So Zaka was born from the need of really pushing this community effort into kind of a bigger, broad mission and really helping the MENA region uh, get into artificial intelligence. And when we say get into AI, we mean we want to see more AI adoption. We want to see more companies implementing AI and more individuals, more talent, you know, capable of building AI projects. We need local talent to be solving local problems. And uh, that's basically the mission of Saka. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, three years. Just in case for the listener who are not familiar with the MENA region, would you like to give quickly give a, 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 a background uh, explanation? What is MENA region and what are the countries are in the MENA region? Yeah, um, so basically the MENA stands for Middle East and North Africa. And so uh, the countries including obviously Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Qatar, Oman, all the way to CCC and also North Africa, like Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, so um, the, the whole range of, of these countries. What we currently focus on at Zaka is basically uh, more of the Gulf region at the moment. So we, we started in Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, and right now we're you know, reaching as well Qatar and Oman uh, and Kuwait. Um, and hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll also uh, scale to the rest of the MENA region. That is fascinating. Now, what do you hope to achieve for the AI 
community in the MENA region to your company at Jaka? Well, we really hope that, you know, in the next couple of years, we can see a, a vibrant ecosystem here in the region. So we can see basically, as I said, more adoption of AI, more companies implementing AI in their products. Uh, we want to see local people uh, solving local problems. And that's the beauty of AI. It's, it's a technology, right? It's something, it's a tool that you can use to help you solve problems in an efficient, smart way. And uh, each, you know, each country and each region has its own unique set of problems. And that's why you need local people to be able to solve local problems, right? You cannot expect, you know, engineers sitting in, you know, let's say Silicon Valley to solve your problems because they have no idea what you're going through. And that's right. why we need local people, local skilled talent in artificial intelligence to be building solutions for the local market. Uh, and so ideally, we'd like to have this, you know, a vibrant ecosystem where, as I said, companies are implementing AI. There's a lot of opportunities. We have startups in AI. We have governments, you know, uh, uh, kind of pushing these initiatives. So um, that's the goal we're working towards. I think that what you just mentioned about the local people for the local challenges is so, so important because you guys, uh, the local people would have the context about the challenges. The local people would have the context about all the nuances of all those little things that um, the overseas foreigner may not necessarily have. And the best way is how to also, not, not more than that, is also how to build up the, uh, the talent in serving uh, the economy, how to build up the economy that you could enjoy like the Silicon Valley. So that 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 is so important. I just want to give you a big shout out on that one. Hundred percent. I I totally agree. Now, on that note, compared to countries like the United States and perhaps China or Europe, um, what are the challenges that you, that the MENA region faced? in spreading AI education? Um, so first of all, I, I do believe that this, this problem is not just in Domina, it's globally. So uh, education on AI is, is something that's needed everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, in the US and in China and in the more advanced developed countries, you have much more talent than you have you know, in the region here. But it's still a global, there's a global shortage of talent when it comes to artificial intelligence and data science and you know, the related topics. And so um, in terms of the challenges here, other than the, the talents, you also have challenges, for example, of uh, data. Uh, because as you know, our AI depends a lot on data, on access to big data. And um, it, it, this is also something that the governments and the countries themselves should be kind of have a, a data culture or data mentality that allows them to, you know, um, unify the access to data and have, you know, open access to some information because you need data to be able to build some, you know, useful ML products. Um, so I would believe that yeah, the challenges are mainly access to talent, which, you know, uh, we're hoping to change that. Also access to, to, to funding and access to opportunities and uh, maybe also government having some clear vision of, of you know, like the AI strategy, which, by the way, uh, many of the countries in the region have recently uh, put an action or, or basically put a plan for their AI strategy. So if you look at, let's say, Saudi Arabia's uh, vision, 2030 vision, or, or similar uh, in Qatar as well. So you have some countries where they've actually stated we're interested in, you know, implementing AI in those, you know, uh, aspects. And they have a clear vision, they have a clear mission, and, you know, they're working towards it. Uh, also, if you look at the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, they do have a ministry of AI and they do have, um, you know, it's, it's much more um, developed than other countries. So one of the issues that is also found in the region is this basically uh, difference or gap between, you know, some countries in the region are very advanced when it comes to implementing and adopting and pushing artificial intelligence, like example, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And you have other countries who are still completely uh, clueless of where we want to go and you know what's the next step and what is our vision. So um, there's this huge you know gap or difference, and um, it's something that I believe it's kind of unique to the region, as opposed to other regions where 
more or less you don't see this difference between the countries, right? They're more or less mm -hmm. similar in, in, in the direction they're going. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think this the challenges are going to be slowly faded away in the, you know, in the coming few years because you know we're working towards that. Governments have started implementing uh, not just planning a vision but also upskilling, uh, you know, capacity building, making sure that everyone is digital. A digital you know uh, knowledgeable in digital skills and you know ai is one of the skills that are needed in the digital world do you think the government of those countries who are well ahead who are far more ahead in this journey compared to other countries within the region what what do you think is the the the, the key driver or what is the thing that is helping them to push so much further in that journey I, I would say it's mainly two things. First of all, obviously, they have the vision, they have the willingness that they see that this is the future and they're very interested in pushing towards that future. And second, obviously, having funds, having the capacity to actually invest you know, money and resources to push the, their countries uh, to go there. So it's a combination of you know, uh, you know, willingness to go there and also the, the, the funds to, to enable that. When you were talking about that, then I tried to understand more about MENA region. And first thing first that it came to my mind is the language. The, in terms of the spoken language, the written language, especially the written language, I can imagine, or at least I, from what I see, is that the, obviously the languages is different, right? And processing the language, the input output of the language, given that it's so vastly different, would you mind to educate me? Does it actually make your job in terms of the data storage, the processing of the data, understanding the data and structure and unstructure them in the table, does it actually make it more difficult? I mean, for example, if I were to think about Arabic, I'm trying to visualize that in my head. How exactly is being structured in the table? What, what does that mean? What is that? How is that like? If... Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point. And I can't believe I missed that. But uh, thank you for reminding me. Uh, as you said, like the main language in the region is Arabic. and it's not uh, it's not the same Arabic, so there are different dialects from different countries, but it's mostly the same language. It's still Arabic. And if you combine all the different dialects, I would believe Arabic is like the second or the third most spoken language in the world, right? So it, there's a huge number of people that speak this language. But if you look in, on the AI, uh, you know, uh, papers and the researches and the, the tools that are out there, there is a very few limited ones that actually supports Arabic. So this is one of the issues that I told you about where we need local people to be solving local problems. So mm. that's one of them, right? So uh, let's say if you're working on NLP, natural language processing, mm. um, most of the resources out there, you'll find about the English language because you know, most of the people working on them are you know, people working in, uh, in the US or in, in Europe or somewhere where English is the main language. Mm. Um, and so we need to have more people uh, you know, pushing Arabic or AI for the Arabic language, and it's it's happening. It's not like there's nothing out there, but it's not going as you know at the same pace where development for the English language is, is going there. And so, um, if you want to build, let's say, a project of, uh, use, using let's say AI for NLP in, in English, it's very easy, more or less, to do it because there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of libraries, there are examples. It's just easy to, to, to support it. Whereas when you go to the Arabic language, it's not as as, as such. Um, so to answer your questions, when when you're dealing with the Arabic text, at the end of the day, you're not going to invent you know everything from scratch. You will be using some tools and some mm -hmm. libraries that will make your life easy. And this is where it depends. So in some cases, you have tools that you know make your life much easier. So you can just use those. In other cases, where those tools do not exist, then yes, it's a bit difficult and you have to, you know, figure things out yourself. You have to kind of work around your challenges.
Um, so I would say, yes, the Arabic language is one of also the challenges that we have in the region to apply artificial intelligence. Thank you so much for shedding some light in terms of the language. I think, as you were explaining, it, it really got me thinking a lot. Um, say, for example, I, I actually can speak four or five languages, but then at the same time, I can't help but to think that, for example, there are so many other countries where uh, English obviously is not the main language. What that equally mean is if the language is not the if, if the main language is not English and English is not the main uh, media, is not the main language for the medium of exchange. And, and, and with another factor where if the population, that is not enough population to support um, that language, I feel like the education itself of, of translating the English lit literature in the AI in data science into that language where more people can be uh, educated in that uh, subject, it could be really difficult. I, I, I feel like that is almost like an instant barrier for some of the country that is already out there. I, I, I feel like perhaps the lucky thing, like you say, is um, Arabic is one of the most spoken language because it's spoken in so many countries. So I think it looks like at least you guys are, are safe from that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, 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 I'm aligned with what you're saying and um, definitely having, you know, breaking this barrier to language is, is definitely gonna have a huge impact on who will be able to understand and apply AI because, you know, if you can, understand the literature and if you can uh, you know benefit from the the knowledge pool of, of all of the you know uh, the papers and the, the libraries and all the work that has been done then you can suddenly have democratization of, of the AI knowledge across mm. different cultures and different countries so definitely this would help to have you know access to the language apart from language barrier do you have any suggestion on how we can make ai education more accessible to to, to the people in the mina region uh so it's basically what we're focusing on right so it's it's providing the education whether it's in form of just awareness sessions or it's more detailed hands-on applied workshops whatever it is i really believe that everyone not just in the MENA region, but everyone should basically understand what artificial intelligence is, um, mm. mainly because it's such a powerful tool that's affecting everyone's lives. And it's not something that only technical people, you know, should, should understand or should be aware of it. I believe just like the internet, like everyone uses the internet, whether they understand how it works or not, they are using the internet, right? Every time they send a message, on their phone or they, I don't know, uh, send an email, this, uh, open uh, Facebook or any social network, they're using the internet, right? So they should understand basic things. And I believe AI is a very powerful technology that is fueling a lot of the products that we are using, um, especially on, this, on the smartphone. And so again, I, I believe people should really basically have a clear understanding of what AI is because there's a big misconception. So most people, when you tell them, artificial intelligence, the first thing they hear or they think about are robots. They think, yes. they imagine a robot <laughs> and, and they think, yeah, right. AI is robots, which is not exactly the case. AI is not right. robotic. Most of the AI we talk about today, you know, it's these are algorithms. This is machine learning or deep learning. And these algorithms are, you know, um, they're hidden, they're, they're kind of, they're not uh, visible as, as a robot. So people, when they tend not to see them, they tend to ignore them. And then you get basically um the, the powerful ways that algorithms are currently kind of not controlling but actually they have a huge impact on our lives right so when you open youtube and you 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 look at the recommendations like this is an algorithm that's recommending a video for you to watch and it can easily recommend you know different ways to get you into different things same thing when you go to on netflix or you go to any other uh you know maybe e-commerce website they're recommending things to you this is all algorithm based when you see an ad, you know, on online, this this ad is not randomly shown to you. It's actually looking at what what Jason, let's say, is interested in, 
what you know who is jason who's who, who's that profile trying to match you with ads that are relevant to you and um it's important to understand how they can make this right because a lot of people think that uh, uh let's say that the facebook is spying on them and they're listening to their conversations and that's how they're able to show such targeting targeted ads which is not the case it's, it's actually facebook have built a really good model on, on each person and they can really understand you know what does jason like and what is jason interested in and they can predict that and they can show you things even before you maybe think about it so uh, it's definitely cool but it's also a bit scary um, and understanding how it works definitely helps you know to cope with the new world and the new way of uh, of living uh, so that's why going back to my point i believe everyone should should understand what ai is should understand how ai is affecting their industry and this is something i tell all students and not just technical students because you know i i meet a lot of students uh, uh, through through our workshops and through our uh, webinars and a lot of them are computer science and computer engineering students so they are technical and so they kind of are interested in ai but i also mm. meet others who are not right and i tell the others like people coming from business and finance and marketing and whatever background they are i tell them you should understand ai and you should understand how this technology is affecting your industry because you know whatever your job is at the moment in a couple of years it's going to be altered by ai it's going to be mm. somehow using artificial intelligence in a way and if you can really understand how this is going to change your industry you can position yourself in a way that you don't get left behind or you, or your job doesn't get let's say automated or replaced because this is the huge you know fear around ai the, the automation part and the, the job elimination and what's going to happen to a lot of the jobs that are currently being automated and so the answer to that is just figure out how your job is changing and change with it because ai is not going to uh, completely replace a job it's just going to change the way this job is done it's going to allow whoever is doing the job to uh, maybe focus more on the creative part and eliminate maybe the the redundant boring part right so it's going to be somehow changing the job and if you understand how you can position yourself to take advantage and to be relevant in the job market you know in the future 100% spot on understanding how the circumstances and the landscape are changing and how we use that ai to to complement uh, what they do i i i really like that man plus the machine uh, philosophy now that's one thing that i do want to ask you i know you travel extensively in europe and also in the MENA region, if you were to compare between the two, what is the what is what is the unique thing about the AI community in the MENA region? Um, I mean, the, the most exciting thing I would say is uh, how fast it's growing and how how much people are really interested in, in you know in applying and, and going into the field. So. Uh, because maybe europe uh, or the european ecosystem is a bit more advanced than the ecosystem here um so people are um it's not going as fast as it's growing here so um people in the region the mina region they're very interested again in, in understanding and pushing and you know going into the field because there's a huge untapped potential here right so we suddenly realize that there's this huge exciting opportunity that you know um, no one's actually been doing a lot of things in that space so mm. people are just rushing there and you know i would believe it's growing really fast um so in the next couple of years you're going to see a whole different you know ecosystem here than it was earlier and i would say this is the if you want to compare them i would say the growth rate um uh, is much higher here than in europe do you think the same language, which is Arabic language, plays a role in speeding that up as opposed to multiple languages that um, 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 the European would have to, to face? Um, I mean, maybe, but not entirely, because uh, even though, you know, everyone speaks Arabic, as I said, there's different dialects and so mm. most of the um discussion mostly happens in, in english and Arabic. it's mixed right so there's not just a, not everyone speaking arabic all the time 
so usually it's done in English, and then there's also the casual discussions that are happening in Arabic. But um, maybe I mean I mean Arabic definitely does help because you know it links everyone with the same uh, base, right? The same connection. So you you know that you're talking to someone who shares a lot of the same culture that that you share. But uh, I wouldn't say exactly it's because of the language. I would say right. again it's because you know it, there's a lot of untapped potential and there's a lot of you know uh, things that can be leveraged that can be done so kind of like lo uh, low hanging fruits and then it kind of accelerates from there can you see a world um to where there are more collaboration in the ai between the mina region or other parts of the world i i hope so i sure hope so because i collaboration is <laughs> Is you know definitely needed, right? Uh, it's always good to leverage each other's strength instead of kind of competing. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I would hope so. I have no idea how, how this will play out, but uh, any next. particular area of interest that you hope to see more of that happening? Uh, I mean, my interest at the moment is education, and is really mm. making sure that you know. Everyone again understands what this technology is, and it's very crucial because having a, a digital nation, having people who you know understands how the basic concepts work, would have a lot of effect in the future on on a lot of things. Um, so you start with educating you know the public around digital skills. AI is one of them, and then just give it a couple of years, and you'll see you know amazing things happening. On the note of the education, does the academy world, like the university in the MENA region, um, often have this sort of exchange program with other parts of the world, like US, Europe, and Asia, so that um, you guys can learn from each other? Um, yes, I mean, of course, uh, each university has its different affiliations and, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, training programs with other universities but my issue with this is i don't believe that universities um, are really preparing the students for the job market and uh, i would say this not just in the region i would say it's almost almost globally mm. um, and it's not really the fault of the universities but it's also because this field is moving at such a rapid pace that the universities and the curriculum cannot keep up because you cannot really update the curriculum every six months, right? There's an accreditation process that takes right. a couple of years. There's a lot of things that, you know, so the, the, the way to update it, it's a bit slower than the actual market needs. And so what I would say is that you, all the students would need to kind of bridge the gap. We need to get additional education. Uh, in addition to the university education, they need to get some practical hands-on education that really prepares them for the job market, especially, specifically in AI, for example. Um, the university can give them the, the foundation, can give them the theory, but it's not going to train them on the current, uh, the cutting edge tools that are being used currently, like what, what libraries are being used. Uh, you know, like TensorFlow, every six months you have a new version, you have a new updates. Right? That, that, that's one example. Imagine the number of papers going out every day in the AI field. Imagine the frameworks, the libraries, the tools, uh, the, the, the architectures, you know. So, it's really moving fast, and it's again, it's not the job, it's not the fault of the universities, but they cannot really keep up. And this is what we focus on uh, at Zaka during our programs: is that we want to, you know, bridge this gap between what they take at university and what the market requires in terms of skills. And it's this addition, this this gap that actually makes those students well, you know, positioned for the job market, and it's going to help. Uh, the ecosystem flourish because again you're going to have more local skilled talent you're going to have more companies hiring local skills and working on projects and you know kind of booming in the sector uh, because you're solving the number one issue which is lack of talent on that note following out on that do you think the university that sh should change the foundation of what they offer to the student in, in, in the world that where everything are happening faster and faster, perhaps the university should fall back and play the role of 
helping the student to be a critical thinker how to how to solve problem rather than focusing on the the latest tools in the market um 100 i do believe that all the educational institution even schools need to at least change some of the things that they're currently doing because nothing actually changed in the way we learn in the last 100 years or maybe more but if you look at our world and our the way things are it's completely changed like especially the last 20 years with the introduction of the internet the democratization of information uh, and with ai it's exponentially growing at exponential rate and everything is changing and so even the knowledge like what what you learn at university let's say go back 100 years ago you would learn something at university and it's going to serve you your whole career because nothing is changing right the same information is more or less going to stay the same right now what, everything we know at the, right now is going to be obsolete in a couple of years specifically the technical skills because things are moving really rapidly and new things are being added and technology is advancing and you have new research so because of this change so rapid change you cannot really teach people exactly one thing and that's it you're going to have to teach them how to learn how to keep learning and that's this thing called lifelong learning right so everything we know at the moment again is we're going to have to relearn new things in five in five years or maybe 10 years time so having this principle in mind i believe educational institutions should educate the students not on on the actual content but rather on how to think and how to learn and how to relearn and how to you know what are the skills that they need to have that will last them 100 years instead of knowledge that's going to be obsolete in five years so definitely they should change the way they approach and i also think individuals should also know that just because you know you can't attend university for a couple of years and then expect to stop learning my job is done you should always be in learning mode you should always be up to date with you know what's what's new what's happening what's the new advances in my field because again it's not going to be the same it's, it's not static it's super dynamic it's changing very rapidly and so stay in learning mode to stay relevant in the job market i was born and grew up in asia and i received my earlier education in asia and subsequently i received my higher education in australia and there are two very different culture in terms of uh, approaching the education i can see the pro and con in both sides of the world for someone who lack of the knowledge and the background about the mina region what sort of approach or style would you say mina region is similar to would that be more similar to the uh, 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 the Asian style of education, or is it more similar to the Western style? Um, okay, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I would say it depends on the countries. So we have some countries where um, it follows like the English education system, and mm -hmm. so I would say it's more of on the Western. And uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, what do you exactly mean by let's say? Western versus Eastern education. Uh, so the way that I look at it, for more of my personal experience, is the, the the Eastern world is probably focused a lot on the practice, 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 memorization, uh, getting a good grade. Obviously, the West also wants you to get a good grade, but perhaps not so much about practice practice uh of the question but more about more encouraging about expressing yourself uh in 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 that sort of way rather than how to solve that problem exactly to get the, the good grade yeah exactly okay um yeah uh, I, I understand your point um i don't exactly know over the whole region like I, again i think it depends from country to country and um, which educational system they they follow but i do know for example in lebanon it's it's more on the eastern approach where it's it's very hard system um you know you, we we study three languages most lebanese speak three languages arabic french and english 
mm-hmm. and our our math and our you know stem um, um, subjects are are a bit advanced compared to others and this is what i hear from all of my friends who maybe traveled and continued education abroad um, i do believe we have more on the eastern approach where you know study 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 take a lot mm-hmm. of things uh, practice mm-hmm. uh, instead of just doing it more flexibly let's say mm-hmm. um i can't say exactly the same for the rest of the region because i'm not really aware of the educational system there but you might find similar to lebanon you might find something a bit closer to the western so it depends on which country you're uh, you're talking sure. about i found that super interesting that you just mentioned that you most of the lebanese have to learn three languages i arabic french and english for for my personal experience i i can almost relate to that so what i mean by that is i my for my primary educate for my first year first six years of the primary education i did everything in chinese i learned everything i spoke everything in chinese and then for the subsequent six years uh in the middle school and the high school i did everything in bahasa malaysia or malay and then for my university i did everything in english so it's almost like i have to switch from one thing to another thing and to some extent sometimes i have to relearn a couple of things again because they are entirely different uh alien to me if i if i, if I don't try to is that a similar experience for for you or for the Lebanese when you were describing that three languages or it, it is not like that uh, it's not really like that so um i mean I, it depends on which so we in lebanon we have two school systems we have the french system and the english uh, education system um mm. but most people um uh, like um historically i think it was more of the french system so a lot of the people uh, used to go to french schools and the french schools we we are taught french from a very early age french and arabic and then also english uh, as well but it's not like uh, the main language spoken in school was french so all the subjects were we were taught in french and also uh with some english courses and of course arabic courses Correct. um and whereas the english education system the main uh, language is the english right so the, there's no french in, in those schools uh, but the majority of schools in lebanon are french based schools so that's why um, most of the lebanese people do speak three languages and same thing at university but not as much so universities in lebanon they're like maybe 50 50 so you have some maybe less i think you would have like 20 30% uh, that are french based where we speak french uh, in class and the majority is uh, maybe english based because you know english is is, uh, is more common nowadays and uh, uh, education in english is, is more common as well uh, so yeah i would say this this is the the way the way it is but uh, you have to know something also be, that lebanese language even the arabic language of lebanese it's a mixture of english and arabic and french right because because you interact on a day to day basis with a lot of people and uh, you know uh, in different languages uh when you talk lebanese arabic it's not the same as the let's say arabic of other people not only because it's a different, different dialect or different pronunciation but also because we do use a lot of the lexicon a lot of the words that are coming from french or from english uh, in our day to day for example everyone says bonjour in mm. lebanon uh, which is a you know french word for hello and yes. even if uh, like anyone in lebanon you just go in and say bonjour no one looks at you like why are you talking french it's it's, a, it's an arabic it's a lebanese word in a way <laughs> right right i i did a study exchange during the uni to to france so i did try to pick up some french in the old days but not much of the success i think um one thing that i still curious to know is is when i was explaining or sharing my experience um part of that is also where when i was learning maths um i was i was learning maths and science in chinese and then subsequently i was learning maths and science in malay and then again i repeat the whole thing uh in english so it, it could be really challenging to switch 
in especially in those uh, scientific terms and all of those things that these days I, try, I tend to think a lot more just in the English term. So I think that that is where I come from. That being said, when you have two so distinctive languages throughout from primary to middle school to high school to university, one in French while the other in, in English, how do you get how do you get two different how do you get the people who come from two different schools to, to, to talk to each other, especially in the business setting there? Um yeah, I mean everyone speaks Lebanese, right? So that's at least a common ground. And okay. as I said, most of the yeah, most of the French educated uh, students speak English as well. Uh, sure. the, the opposite is not the same. So most of the English speaking students do not speak French. And so usually um, we speak English or Lebanese and everyone understands. And uh, if you speak French, then you can also speak French with the people who understand French. But, right. Uh, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's the mixture. So that's why I said that the Lebanese language incorporates English and French words because it's maybe because of people trying to communicate together from mm. different backgrounds so eventually we ended up creating this language that uh, incorporates those words you know and, and as well that is so fascinating now if the world wants to learn more about what the MENA region has got to offer with AI what is the best place for them to, to for them to start exploring um maybe check out Zaka and, and follow follow what we do <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I'm not aware of a, a main, uh, you know, place to check out the AI advancements or anything in MENA. There's a lot of uh, uh, maybe publications that share news or startup news on in the MENA, like uh, uh, Magnet, like WAMDA. So these are some websites that uh, people can check out to learn about the ecosystem, uh, startup ecosystem in the region. Uh, mm. But it's not purely focused on AI. Uh, mm. If we're looking for AI related news um this is what we're trying to also to, to fill this void so hopefully check out zaka and uh, you should find the information certainly i'll make sure to put the website of zaka on the <laughs> website so people can find out more now to to finish up this uh podcast interview these are my two usual questions number one what is your most important first principle um can you can you explain that a bit more most important first principle like for example you think that is so important for you as a core value um so for example maybe i'll take myself and um, for me i think my first principle is to always understand what is the root of the problem before trying to, to solve them. So rather than trying to say, okay, this is the problem and this is how we should solve it. I I think the similar uh, analogy is the Toyota 5Y. So I keep asking why, why, why until we really, really find out the root of the problem. So that for me is one of my first, uh, most important first principles. Mm, okay, I see. Um... I mean, I definitely do agree with you on, on you know, like figure, asking exactly, understanding the problem before solving it, because uh, understanding the problem actually is ha is fifty percent of solving the problem. It's like a, a half of the work is actually understanding why. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to think of what would be my own maybe uh, first principle, um, it would be. Mm, let me think. Maybe, I don't know if it's a first principle, but it's how I usually approach problems um, because usually problems are, are not as simple as like small steps. So it's usually a big problem. So what I would do is I would just try to break it down and then mm -hmm. tackle the first one, the first uh, like, okay, what's the next thing I should do? And then mm -hmm. tackle it one by one. And this makes basically big problems end up being small, small problems that you face that you solve easily right step by step and then eventually work your way towards solving the big one 
Uh, and so maybe I yeah, break down your problems and tackle, okay, what's the next thing I need to do? And then it's going to become clear how to solve the, the next one. And this is something I think a lot of people, maybe they get confused or scared when they facing a big problem, like, okay, how do I tackle whatever X? And they think it's such a big thing that there's no way for me to actually solve it. But what they don't know is if you just focus on the next thing you can do, do that, and then it's going to become clear what the next step is. So take it step by step, and eventually you're going to solve it. Wonderful. Final question is, what is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? Um, there's a lot of these books, actually, <laughs> because uh, I started reading. I have to pick one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, so, yes, yeah, so I came. I started reading books really like uh, after I graduated university, so which is something I regret. I, I wish I started earlier. Uh, but the thing about you know the school system is they kind of force you to read books that you don't like, so you end up hating reading. But actually, reading books is is a is a great thing, right? So I wish I had uh, like in general. But if I want to pick one book, um, I would, one of my favorite books is actually called uh, "Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman." which is talking about uh, the life of Richard Feynman. So I don't know if you know Richard Feynman, but he's a, he's a uh, American uh, f uh, physicist and uh, a Nobel Prize winner. And he's, he's a very interesting person. For me, I really admire his, uh, his whole career, his whole life. And what I like about him the most is, um, is that he's a very smart person, but in a way that's actually practical smart, not the, not the book smart. And so the way he used to say, for example, um, he's not the kind of person that would just memorize words or understand the concept. He was like, okay, how does this actually work? Like, let me just break it down. Let, let me try to understand how it works. And so he went, he started with physics, and then he started solving biology problems and like random things, right? Because he's, he's very interested in how things work actually, practically. And I would really like, um, admire his, uh, his his character and, and the way he approaches life because he lived like a full a full life in my opinion he was someone who's um, you know working in, in physics very interesting advanced quantum physics problem he's also a, a bongo player and he played music and he danced and he painted and you know so he went into the art and uh, the science and kind of the full full round uh, you know uh, aspect of, of life and all because he was a curious person who just were, who, were, who was interested in figuring out life and how everything worked and doing it by himself, right? So he would just break things down, understand how they work, build them right up, and then having this uh, intuition about life. And so, yeah, I, I've read this book like many times, and it's always uh, a f funny, interesting book to read. I love it. I should have to check it out. I think I found a book. I have tagged you in the document. I'll just double check if that is the one. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, um, for dialing in in the early morning uh, to share with us your experience uh, about the AI education in the MENA region. I certainly have picked up so many things and I really appreciate uh, your sharing. Thank you, Jason, for having me. It was a pleasure and uh, yeah, hope to have it uh, again. Thank you.